Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. I don't know if you have ever counted in the Gospels the apparitions of Jesus. There are eight of them. So for which day, from Sunday to Sunday, we might have one special inviting us to contemplate the risen Christ. Today we have the apparition resurrection for St. Thomas and it's connected with the Divine Mercy Sunday. This Divine Mercy Sunday is old thing. It was not that known, it was not that preached as is now in recent decades. There are several points. First of all, this peace be with you. Jesus repeated it again and again. This is taking place on Easter Sunday, the very first one, when Jesus was risen from the dead and in the evening when he came to see the apostles. It is the third day after Jesus was betrayed by Jesus, abandoned by all of his disciples, with the exception of John, and then crucified. So it was quite fresh experience. And then they were afraid for their own lives. So they had abandoned their Lord that time when he was captured. And John tells us that they were afraid, still afraid, because they were hiding for fear of the Judeans. This is especially in John's uh, Gospel, the Southerners, Judeans. Galilee was north, Judea was south, yeah? So those Southerners, those elders from Jerusalem had rejected Jesus. Even more, those priests and scribes in Jerusalem had handed Jesus over to the Romans for his crucifixion. And now what? You know, it's the evening and it's a first encounter. Then when the disciples encounter Jesus for the very first time again after the resurrection, what is in their hearts? Fear, shame, guilt, regret? All of them? It's quite expected, it's quite natural. And Jesus comes with this Jewish shalom, peace be with you. Is the very first gift of the risen Christ, the very first words recorded in the Gospel which Jesus said to the disciples, to his church. So Jesus, in effect, is telling them not to be afraid. And as he said to them, he is saying to us, do not react with fear. His life is so powerful, his triumph is so great, It doesn't exist darkness that can oppose his light. It doesn't exist sin that can resist his grace. The second point, receive the Holy Spirit. This is not just invitation, it's a command. Jesus breathes on each one of them and commands them, receive the Holy Spirit. There's something what we need, what is included in the the ticket of Christianity, but what is absolutely needed on our pilgrimage of faith. It was a very powerful and solemn act. In the Old Testament, in the very first book, Genesis, God breathes into the dust of the earth in order to give Adam the spirit of life, to make a man out of the clay of the ground, to make him a living being. And this breathing into this molded body was the sign of participating in God's life. In the first acts of this new creation, after the resurrection, Jesus wants them to carry out the power that we see manifested in the sacrament of reconciliation, which we commonly call the sacrament of confession. It's somehow really strange why for so many decades now after the Vatican Council, it was somehow misunderstood and pushed aside. This was the very first message on the day of the resurrection. So it must be important. The successors to the apostles have the power not just to forgive sins of those who may have harmed them. It's much more glorious. They have the power to forgive all sins. Sins against themselves, sins against neighbor, sins against God. I mean, it's absolutely amazing what kind of power Jesus conferred on them and commanded them to do it. As usual, there's a kicker in this statement. Jesus gives them the power to retain those sins if the person confessing those sins is not actually penitent, if it's not sorry, if he doesn't desire to stop it. Mercy is available to everyone. 
But mercy you have to receive. You have to stretch your hands and take it. And the condition is try. Try to cut these things which are blocking, which are against God and by the grace of God overcome it. It seems Jesus is dying to institute this sacrament of confession so that they can go out and begin their ministry of reconciliation. They restored peace in their hearts by forgiving their sins, transfer this beautiful gift to the rest of the believers. And then it's the next Sunday, a week later, Thomas encounter with Jesus. We sometimes give him this doubting Thomas demands proof. Uh, and it's quite not just to Thomas because his disbelief helps us much more than the faith of the other ten apostles. So he wants some kind of empirical proof before he will believe that Jesus is actually raised from the dead, that he was actually crucified and there must be some kind of signs of his crucifixion on his body. So there is a certain reasonableness in demanding some kind of evidence for belief. And the church does this for centuries, millennia, all the time with the miracles of the saints. We just don't believe oh, a miracle happened. You have to prove that the miracle happened and very often to prove it, especially in the last two, three centuries, there were hired people who were either hostile to the church or who didn't believe in Christianity to examine the case. And if they said there is no explanation of what happened, okay, we can pronounce the miracle. So you see that this what is coming from Thomas, it is projected for the action of the church. So when Jesus appears to him, to Thomas, Thomas goes above and beyond. Remember, Jesus accepted the challenge. He was not there and he knew what was the challenge. So Thomas doesn't just say, I believe. He says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. I don't think any one of them was expected something like this. That's the very first time in the Gospel of John where someone confesses Jesus not just as Messiah and Lord, but as God. And you have to know that you can give some titles to the Gospels. The title to John's Gospel will be Behold Your God. The whole Gospel is pointing to this as a climax in the pronouncing of Jesus to be divine. Sometimes we tend to forget that Thomas, as earlier Peter, makes an equally, equally amazing confession of faith in the divinity of Christ. Jesus is not human. Jesus is a the divine person who in time assumed our human nature, took it with himself to his heavenly kingdom, so he has two natures in one divine person. This whole Gospel of John has been building up to the revelation of the fullness of Jesus' divinity. He already started in the very first chapter and put on the mouth of Thomas to pronounce it, declare it openly, clearly, beyond any misunderstanding. So Jesus calls all of us to go beyond Thomas. You believe because you can see me. Just consider the question mark. It is not by chance that it was a question, it was not a statement. We do not know if Thomas actually touched Jesus, the risen body of Christ, but he experienced the risen Christ. And he experienced something much more. For sure, you cannot touch divinity. You can touch humanity. You cannot touch divinity. It's spirit. So faith, one of the definitions of faith, is to gaze of a soul upon a saving God. So whatever it was impossible to touch, the eyes of faith could see my Lord and my God. So eyewitnesses saw Jesus alive after his resurrection. What more evidence do we need for his resurrection? <laughs> that would hold up in any court of law. There are witnesses, they testify, it's true. And the last point from the Gospel of today, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You know, blessed means happy. So it's something to be envy if you have it, if it's yours. So Jesus is pronouncing a special blessing on those of us who did not live at the time of Christ. 
those who did not see Jesus will also have their experience. How? One of the common, the risen Christ says, I will touch every one of you in the Eucharist. Do you want to be touched? So there is a lot of comfort in this notion that those of us who believe without seeing Jesus have a special blessing, blessing of the risen Christ, pronounced by the risen Christ to all generations to come. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, this is also connected to the Divine Mercy devotion. It was always called the Divine Mercy a Sunday. It was somehow pushed aside or not preached enough. See it in this context of the Gospel, which Jesus, on the very first day, pronounced the Holy Spirit and forgiveness, restoring peace in our hearts. This is the house where St. Faustina stayed between 1933 and 1936. It still exists, this house. In this house, the Lord Jesus dictated to her the chaplet of the Divine Mercy. You can read it for yourself in her diary. It happened in Vilnius in Lithuania, September 13, 1935. At that time, before the Second World War, Poland and Lithuania, they were like in union, like a bit like United States, like between Florida and Georgia. So they were traveling, there was no really border in between. And Faustina wrote, in the evening when I was in my cell in her room, I saw an angel, the executor of divine wrath. He was clothed in a dazzling robe, his face glorious bright, a cloud beneath his feet, so some spiritual being. From the cloud, bolts of thunder and flashes of lightning were springing into his hands, and from his hand they were going forth, and only then were they striking the earth. This was not the blessing. This was the punishment. It was something terrifying. When I saw this sign of divine wrath, which was about to strike the earth, and in particular a certain place, which for good reason I cannot name, most probably the capital, I began to implore the angel to hold off for a few moments, and the whole world would do penance. Now, how do the world would do penance if only she knows about it? So she will do the penance on behalf of the world and trying to stop the punishment, the just punishment. But my plea was a mere nothing in the face of the divine anger. Just put it in the timeline. We know a bit more of the story. This is the canonized saint, a special friend of Jesus. And her prayers were a mere nothing? Why? Because it was her prayers. When she was given the prayer, there was a difference. At that very moment, I felt in my soul the power of Jesus' grace which dwells in my soul. She remembered in the morning there was a Mass. She has received the Holy Communion. She was supported by the grace of the daily Mass. When I became conscious of this grace, I was instantly brought before the throne of God to intercede. Not because of her, because of the grace received at the Mass in the morning. I found myself pleading with God for the word with words heard eternally. The words were given to her. Her prayers didn't work, but the prayer which was given to her was very powerful. As I was praying in this manner, I saw the angel's helplessness. She could stop the angel. He could not carry out the just punishment which was rightly due for sins. And never before had I prayed with such inner power as I did then, being obedient to this inspiration which came to her. You can read everything from her diary, either reading, listening, both are available on the market. It's nothing really new. God doesn't need our permission for anything. But look at the beginning of salvation story with Abraham. When Sodom and Gomorrah went in such wrong direction, God was about to hit, to punish justly for the sins. But before these angels left for Sodom and Gomorrah, they gave chance to Abraham to plead for them. 
And as he couldn't find even ten righteous people, at least he managed to save his nephew and his family. Even if you see from the Bible, they were not much better than the other people from Sodom and Gomorrah. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was the symptom of a deep and stubborn rebellion against God. Rebellion against everything that was natural, simple, innocent, free, and good. And that's why the punishment came, just punishment for sins. The words with which I entreat God are this. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, for our sins and those of the whole world. This is not exactly what we pray, because this is the very first time when she received it was corrected later. And then the second part, for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us. The next morning, when I entered the chapel, I heard these words internally. Every time you enter the chapel, with the Blessed Sacrament, immediately recite the prayer which I taught you yesterday. You know it by heart. We are praying it so often, the Divine Mercy Chaplet in the Church. If you don't know how to start your prayer, that's how you start, the title and one of the invocations. It works. It made a saint. So when I had said the prayer in my soul, I heard these words. This prayer will serve to appease my wrath, to put the just punishment aside. You will recite it for nine days on the beads of the rosary. This is how we finished yesterday this great novena, appealing to the greatest attribute of God, to his goodness, to his mercy. Try to take it on the common sense, because this helps you to understand how God really loves us, how he is on our side. He doesn't need any permission to hit anyone, to punish anyone. He sends his angel. Before the angel arrives, they have no limit on speed. He shows the vision to the sister, poor nun, in the convent. She starts to pray. She doesn't know how to pray. So the prayer is given to her. The prayer stops the angel and the punishment is stopped. Does it make any sense? Why all this whole action? To show the reasoning of God. I like this example and I know that we are all equally guilty for it. We know how to push the buttons of our mothers because you stay with them the whole day. And the poor mother, you know, enough is enough and she has to straighten you and she has to put you in order and running after this little monkey and trying to hit it and, and still hoping, I think, the last month, I have to hit you because you misbehave, but maybe I will miss. This is what is a way of acting by God. Some people are asking, do you have to discipline your children? And Dr. Guarendi, he is answering this, of course. Because if you don't, the world will discipline them without love, without gentleness. So it's much better with a gentle hand, with a loving heart, than then later being disciplined by the world. This film was extended to the whole church by John Paul, now St. John Paul II. He was repeating her words, Oh, what great graces I will grant to souls who say this chaplet. So take it. Write down these words my daughter Jesus said to her. Speak to the word about my mercy. Let all mankind recognize my unfavorable mercy. Turn to the goodness of God. It is the sign for the end times. After it will come the day of justice. Remember Abraham? He was given warning just before the destruction came. So Jesus is the giving warning before he has to come. Make preparation. Usually you don't make preparation for the new child in the family if you are not pregnant. This something, you know, whatever time is given to us, Make use of it. While there is still time, let them have recourse to the fountain of my mercy. Let them profit from the blood and water which gushed for, for them, straight from the cross. The message of the divine mercy, John Paul wrote, takes on powerful new focus, calling people to a deeper understanding that God's love is unlimited and available to everyone especially the greatest sinners.
As I mentioned to you many times and for Florida is very much applying, will God ever be tired to love us, to forgive us? It's like asking water if the water would be tired to be wet. It's his nature. The loving kindness is his nature. And that's what is expected from us to turn to him, to use it for our own benefit. Pope Francis offered us a few years ago the opportunity to encounter this incredible mercy of God. He wrote, encountering mercy means encountering God. It's like mercy is God, God is mercy. God can transform our life, relationship work, our ability to embrace and experience all of life. So what do you have to lose? Check the goodness of God. Immerse yourself in his unmeasurable mercy and experience this deep peace in your heart by being forgiven, by being restored by his goodness.